Hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, P4 Expert Roundtable series. Today, we're going to be doing a quick panel on P4 enabled solutions for operator networks. My name is Brian O'Connor, and I'm currently at the Open Networking Foundation working on Stratum and P4 programmable architectures. So today in our panel, we'll have uh, three folks. Myself, we have Suresh Krishnan, who's the CTO at Kaloom, and Vijay Sivaraman, who's the co-founder and CEO at Canopus Networks. So before we get started, I wanted to provide a, a quick landscape uh, for what some of the opportunities are for P4 in operator networks as we see them at ONF today. So just to give you a little bit of background, ONF is an operator-led community built by and for network operators. So the use cases and projects that we work on are driven specifically by their needs and requirements. And one of the things we're starting to see is that the ONF community has started to embrace P4. Uh, first, ONF has become the host to P4.org and hosts many open source P4 programs and pipelines that are references for some of the, uh, the architectures we're talking about. We're the host to Stratum, which is a switch OS built around P4 and, and other related concepts. And we've extended our flagship SDN control plane called Onos to support P4 and P4 runtime. P4 is also making its way into all of the major ONF use cases and solutions. We see P4 as part of Trellis, SIBA, which is our access solution, ODTN, inter-data center, uh, connectivity solution, Ether, for 4G and 5G mobile access, and our next-gen SDN platforms. I want to go into just a few ways in which we see P4 enhancing some of these use cases. And the first way is we see P4 enabling SDN. Uh, ONF has deployed Trellis with OpenFlow at Comcast, and that deployment has gone exceedingly well, but there have been things that we've learned along the way. And we hope that a lot of those things that we've learned can be fixed or enhanced using P4. So first and foremost, P4 provides a clear contract that enables heterogeneity. This means we can put in boxes from different vendors into our solutions. And we're, we're starting to see that uh, in Trellis today with P4. We've moved from OpenFlow to P4 Runtime, which has provided multiple enhancements. For example, at the protocol level, the move to gRPC solves a number of fundamental issues we were seeing in OpenFlow. And P4 Runtime provides a much better path to extensibility than we had with OpenFlow. And lastly, P4 is enhancing the speed at which data plane features can be introduced into the fabric. So today, Trellis works on switches for multiple hardware vendors using Stratum. And down here in the picture, you can see an example of a field office and central office uh, controlled by Stratum switches, uh, and then uh, with Trellis, Onos, and ODTN running on top. The next thing that P4 does is it improves network functions. So one of the things cloud operators have realized is that all the functions like firewalls, load balancers, et cetera, in their network uh, first were virtualized, uh, which solved some problems, created some of its own. Uh, but one of the things we're seeing now is that P4 is helping uh, to solve this, this problem that, that virtual network functions or container network functions have created. The first idea is disaggregate network functions. And the second idea is, is take the data plane portion and put it onto hardware. Some of the benefits operators are seeing by doing this are increased performance or throughput, reduced jitter and latency, and then um, reduced compute resources and power consumption for the same network loads. At ONF, we have a few open source examples of this. The first is SDBNG, or Software Defined uh, BNG, where we've disaggregated the BNG into a control plane application that runs on ONOS, and then we run the user plane in Merchant Silicon, available from the Open Compute Project community. The other example is Ether. And in Ether, we're taking pieces of the 4G and 5G user plane and embedding that into the fabric so that things like uh, GTP tunnels can be uh, can be managed uh, in the data plane, and then uh, rules are, are managed up at the ONOS layer. So user traffic in both cases stays on the data plane, and it's only the control traffic uh, that needs to go up to our control plane. Lastly, we see operators using P4 to enhance visibility. The P4 community has introduced INT, or in-band network telemetry, which gives operators an ability to monitor any and now every packet that flows through their network which is leading to improved user experience and enhanced debuggability. This means new revenue streams or revenue sources from their existing customers, 
And it also means less customer downtime because network problems can be pinpointed more precisely and more quickly. P4 is also forming the basis for zero touch operations and closed loop control. Um, and that's uh, something that's fundamental towards scaling operations without dramatically in increasing the costs uh, that vendors are seeing. So lastly, uh, ONF has a portfolio of things in the P4 space that you may find to be, uh, to be useful if you're starting to build solutions in this area. The first is fabric.p4. It's a P4 program built for operators containing L2, L3, MPLS, double VLAN, multicast, all of the features that, that are packed into Trellis. And it's become the foundation for the development of network functions like INT, the SDBNG work, and the Ether user plane. The second is Stratum, which is a next generation thin switch operating system. We support P4 and P4 runtime on the data plane side, and then open config, GNMI, and GNOI on control configuration and monitoring. Uh, Stratum today works on data center switches, as well as FPGA NICs, packet optical transponders, and some software switches. The next platform is Onos, a SDN control plane with high performance and availability. Originally supporting only OpenFlow, we've expanded it to now support P4 runtime, P4 open config, and GNMI. And finally, Trellis, an SDN powered leaf spine fabric with uh, network operator features that we've talked about. It's designed for scale and extensibility and now uh, includes P4. So that's all I had for the introduction, and I'd like to turn it over to Suresh, who's going to talk about Kalum's perspective. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, my name is Suresh Krishnan. I'm the CTO of Kalum. So I have a long networking background. So I was like, uh, I've been with Kalum like pretty much since the beginning, around three years ago, we started up. And uh, prior to that, I have about two decades at like uh, Ericsson and Cisco. So I have like a very strong background in um, mobile networks and IP networks. And uh, I've also been the area director of the ITF for the internet area. I just like finished my four years uh, over there, uh, working on like the core internet protocols. And uh, today, like uh, I want to talk a little bit about like one of the products we have at Kaloom, which is a 5G UPF. So it pretty much like, you know, does the entire data plane processing. It's exactly in the same direction that like, you know, Brian was talking about, like how do we disaggregate the network and, and put like the data plane processing on a fast path. And that's exactly what we're doing for uh, 5G, okay? So uh, I'll take a few minutes to talk about what we do and then open up to Brian for questions afterwards, after Vijay is done as well. Um, so Brian, do you want me to start sharing the slides in this one or? Yeah, could you please share your slides? Okay, sounds good, thanks. We can see them now. Excellent. So what we have done is like we built a, a, a suite of products, like all using programmable silicon, like everything programmed using P4. So we started off doing a fabric, like for the data centers, we again went to the edge, like we have an edge fabric that's like really optimized for scaling down. And then we have the 5G UPF, which is like, can either be instantiated as a function inside the fabrics, or it can be a standalone function because like we see uh, both the kind of like requirements from the operators, like now how they want to um, like interoperate this. Some people want like everything built in together and some people already have made their fabric investments and they want to keep it while improving their mobile networks. So like we kind of kept the deployments flexible. And this is built on the, uh, the Barefoot Tofino, which is now the Intel uh, Barefoot Tofino ASIC. And this is programmed using P4. And our goal is to do like a very high throughput uh, application on this, like, and uh, trying to keep the latency very low. And this is like something we see quite pretty much across the world. Uh, when we start seeing the 5G deployments, like uh, if you start adding up the numbers, like looking at the uh, microwave, like, uh, you know, the millimeter wave stuff and everything, and uh, like things start getting uh, highly scalable very, very quickly. So even at edge data centers, like we are talking about like, you know, close to terabit throughputs, uh, when the uh, networks are fully built out. So uh, this is something we really want to be able to support and enable in a very energy efficient manner. And uh, so why did we pick uh, P4? So like uh, originally, like, you know, uh, like me and our chief architect pair, like, you know, we were thinking about P4 as like a specification language to talk to the development team. So we would write the stuff in P4 and then like, you know, we would code it in some other thing like microcode or whatever. 
But then we um, stumbled upon the, the Tofino ASIC, and then we said, hey, this can natively run P4. So this is like a dream come true for us, right? And that's why we started like saying, okay, let's, let's double down on this and keep using P4 for everything. And it's kind of come in handy. I'll tell you in a, a couple of minutes why it's like very handy. But um, so like the general stuff in P4, like we, we all kind of know, right? We can add like new uh, features and services, right? Like very, very quickly. Uh, you can do innovative things and kind of also gets rid of vendor lock-in. So uh, we are a software company. We don't do any hardware. Uh, we let the customers pick uh, what kind of hardware they want to do. Do they want to buy from ODM A, ODM B, or like a major incumbent vendor shouldn't be an issue right like we can do uh, since we are a software platform we can optimize for whatever hardware that's there and, and can certify and p4 is an industry standard like so it, it's uh, something that like you know more than one company is behind and like you know it's it's something that gives us like quite a bit of hardware independence like going forward so even though there's like um, a few things that run this natively currently like the number of platforms that support p4 natively are going up like pretty much as you speak so um uh, talking about the the benefits of doing this like you know everything in an accelerated forwarding plane um uh, we are talking about like you know multi terabit speeds like you know the, the smallest system we have today is like one and a half terabit uh, of throughput going through it and uh, we can go down to like the one microsecond of latency like uh, passing through just the uh, tofino pieces uh, usually we are clocking around like four microsecond of latency so this is like significantly lower than anything that can be done in a general purpose processor today. And um, so we have like flexible scenarios. So you can deploy this at an edge side to keep the latency down, or you can put it in the central side to keep the, um, the, uh, the throughput up, right? And we can scale to millions of users using heterogeneous hardware. I'll tell you a little bit uh, what it is. And this is like our goal is to really enable multi-vendor networks. So if you look at it, so P4 is like one thing, the hardware independence is one thing, the second thing is if you look at a lot of the mobile operator networks, a lot of them are trying to move from single vendor into multi-vendor. So this is like, could be for strategic financials, like a whole bunch of reasons, even for risk reasons, right? Like in you know, supply chains and everything. So people are really looking at multi-vendor networks and we want to be uh, not only standards compliant internally in the system, but also all to all the not bonds and the disaggregation stuff, right? So Brian was talking about the BNG, like, you know, the control plane and user plane disaggregation. So in mobile, it's a little bit simpler. Because if you look at a 5G network, like it's kind of already disaggregated, right? Like the, so the, standard, the standards themselves uh, are supposed to like a BNG where you had to do this after the fact. In 5G, the, the standards themselves have this thing called CUPS, the control user plane separation, that like has this N4 interface that separates the control and the data plane. So all the session management is happening at the SMF layer, and then it actually does the data plane processing on the UPF which we can independently implement without waiting for the incumbents to do it, right? Because the incumbents are gonna take their own time to do it because it's really not in their interest to separate this stuff. So like, you know, we can go ahead and implement this ahead and then go start working with people um, based on the operator input, like who to go talk to. So um, the packet processing model for this is like pretty straightforward. Like, you know, this is like, this could be pretty much any application. They're like pretty similar, just the, um, the names of the things and like what it's getting done is a bit different, right? Instead of like um, PPPOE and the, and the BNG case, we're gonna do the GTP, uh, NCAP and DCAP. So that, that way, like, you know, pretty much the stuff is pretty similar. So we are doing like session lookups. We are looking at the uh, PDRs which describe, uh, think of it as like a FITO proof for the packets, like how to do it and then do the actions. This could be an NCAP or a DCAP or traffic steering or lawful intercept, and then go through some kind of uh, quality of service like rules over there. So this like, you know, policing, shaping, uh, and the queuing stuff is all done here. And then finally the usage reporting, right? So this is kind of how the, uh, the pipeline looks like in a very abstract way. And uh, so initially, like we started off with just the Tofino, then we realized like you know, scaling up the number of sessions is a bit difficult uh, with a single platform, right? Which is optimized for like speed and, and latency. So we started augmenting this with like uh, other platforms. So like one of the platforms we're using now is like Intel Statics Gen FPGA, uh, which is used to scale up like the number of sessions. So we went from like, you know, hundreds of thousands of sessions to millions of sessions by augmenting something with an FPGA. And, and we are running the same P4. So that's the really cool part. So we are working with companies like, you know, such as like, you know, Intel and Netcope and Nagase, like, you know, to build together an ecosystem where we can take the same P4 code that we wrote for Tofino and run it on the FPGA as well. 
and, and on a Xeon as well, right? So the idea is like we write the code once, verify it once, and then use the right hardware for the right job. So if you want something that's low latency, keep it on like a you know performance ASIC. And if you want like something a little bit more higher touch, like you know, like for example, right, like what uh, Vijay is doing, right? Like you know, we could host that on the Kalum platform on the FPGA. He could write the P4, give it to us using P4 runtime, and run on top of the fabric. So he doesn't have to worry about like the low layer functions, right? And then he can still get all the benefits of it. And we are trying to build this as some sort of ecosystem, which lets us build. Uh, heterogeneous applications on different hardware, just like you talked about, Brian. And uh, so that's pretty much like, you know, the, um, uh, the idea of like, you now what we're trying to do. So um, we try to be as open as possible on everything, all the interfaces as possible. And we really want to be able to work with other companies like who are doing stuff in the same space to um, uh, improve the, both the P4 ecosystem and the openness of the system. Yeah, thanks. Awesome, thanks Suresh for the presentation. Thank you. Next we have uh, Vijay from Canopus, who's the co-founder and CEO to provide his perspective. Thank you very much for that, Brian. Can everyone see my screen? We can see it, yes. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here. So, as you said, I'm uh, Vijay. I'm um, CEO and co-founder of Canopus Networks. Um, um, and kind of like Suresh, I've been working in the networking industry for, uh, well, upwards of 20 years now. Um, I was at a startup in California, and then I moved into academia. I hold a professor professorship, professorship position at UNSW in Sydney, Australia. Um, and for the last uh, well, almost uh, six to eight years, we've been uh, working with the SDN ecosystem, um, you know, including uh, Google and the ONF itself, and and uh, contributed and worked in a in a range of projects. And and this kind of uh, is the genesis of this company is through some of the work that we did in collaboration uh, with Google, with some of the telcos in Australia, and with support from the ONF. So um, if I were to um, uh, look at what the the challenge we are tackling it 's that um, you know telcos uh, internet service providers network operators around the world are in a bit of a tight spot because uh, traffic is growing uh, as we know you know twenty six percent year on year which means every three years it 's doubling yet their revenues are relatively flat and the margins are getting squeezed and in Australia the situation is even more dire the growth of traffic is actually closer to fifty percent and revenues have actually declined over the last few years so now, obviously, this, this is a, a tight spot to be in, um, but, you know, we feel that um, the part of the problem is because operators are largely driving blind on what is actually happening on their network. Um, you know, when, uh, when, when they see that uh, levels of traffic are going high, congestion is going high, they just, you know, throw more bandwidth at the problem. But the issue is that they actually don't have visibility into what customer experience is. Um, and just trying to make the network pipes fatter and fatter obviously means there's a, there's a lot of investment required. And the benefits largely flow to the over-the-top providers. Um, and if operators, what they usually get in return is usually, usually the blame. Um, when my own kids are, are gaming, um, they always blame the network when their game uh, lag spikes. They hardly blame the game provider. Um, and the fact is that commodity is, uh, connectivity is a commoditized service now and the margins are diminishing. So uh, operators really need to focus on what is the new services they can offer that add value to their customers and also retain them uh, with exceptional ex ex uh, experience uh, because uh, customer churn does actually impact the bottom line of operators quite a lot. So that, that's the overall challenge. Now, one could say that, um, hang on, there's been a deep packet inspection you know, out there in the market for 20 plus years. That is absolutely true, but they largely tend to be custom hardware appliances. And that obviously means because it's custom hardware, it's single purpose, it's built one, just for that one purpose. So you have to make that investment just to get that one functionality out. And it tends to be really expensive because it's custom hardware. And to scale it to you know hundreds of gigabits per second and terabits per second, um, it does turn out to be uh, quite, quite expensive from the operator's point of view. 
Uh, of course, as, as Brian himself mentioned, there's been a movement to virtualize all of this and make it a VNF. Um, but the reality is, as Brian has already alluded to, that the cost per gigabit per second tends to be very high um, if you put it uh, you know, on general purpose compute compared to a network switch. And, and when you start scaling it to hundreds of gigabits per second and terabit speeds, the number of cores requires, uh, required becomes really ex excessive. So, um, and, and that's where I suppose Canopus comes in and leverages uh, the, the same paradigm that, uh, that Brian mentioned, which is to try to keep, you know, as much data as possible in, in, a, uh, in a white box programmable P4 uh, data plane in order to get that low cost per gigabit per second and trying to move the intelligence, the logic out into general purpose compute cores. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the, the grunt and the speed and the low cost per gigabit per second of the white box hardware, but you get the flexibility, intelligence, state management, and, and you know, uh, AI machinery and what have you on the compute side. So that's pretty much what our approach is. We, we use a combination of a programmable white box switch uh, as shown in the figure at the bottom. So essentially traffic goes across that switch. And what happens is that the switch um, is able to absorb a majority of the traffic. Why? Because once, let's say you're doing a Netflix stream for an hour, in the first minute, the first few packets have already given a lot of information about the control pro, uh, signaling, you know, be it the, the DNS lookups, the uh, SSL, uh, SNIs embedded in the security certificates, and so on. And beyond that, there is no reason to really um, inspect packets uh, of the remaining 59 minutes of that session. Um, so what instead we do is we, we have the hardware absorb a majority of the traffic, in fact, something like 75 to 80% of the traffic. And thereafter, after the, the first few packets of the flow, the hardware is able to export fine-grained telemetry using some of the paradigms like um, INT or in-network telemetry that, that Brian alluded to. So that hardware is able to absorb a lot of the traffic, meaning that the cost per gigabit per second of overall traffic really drops. But at the same time, it's able to export the telemetry, which we call a pulse, a pulse of a flow. And based on the pulse of a flow, um, and we'll see in the next slide, you'll see that applications have their unique signatures, you know, depending on whether it's a, a video stream or a game or a download or a teleconference or what have you. And that's where we have developed our intellectual property around the AI engines that are able to look at these pulse signatures and able to deduce both the type of application, the type of content, and also the user experience associated with it. So in short, what our approach is, is doing is, is kind of getting the best of both worlds, being able to use off the shelf, shelf hardware so that we get the cost, we get the scalability, we get the vendor choice. And of course, it's a platform that is multi-purpose, can be repurposed for, for some other applications as well. And then the, the software we provide just resides as an application. Uh, and because it's using uh, the pulse of a flow, it is encryption resistant and, and future proof. Um, and just to visually show you what some of these pulses look like, if on the left top, you'll see an application that is uh, doing you know, a, a whole lot of activity for a while, you know, that actually corresponds to loading up the initial buffers of a playback uh, a video stream, in this case, Netflix. And then periodically, it tops up its buffers with chunks of video as the video is getting played out. So that is a very typical signature of Netflix. And, and uh, you'd find that another video player like Disney or YouTube would have a similar profile, except the periodicity, size of the chunks, there'll be variations. And there'll be variations depending on the resolution of the video and so on, uh, which is what our machines are trained on. And contrast that with the right top where we have a Twitch stream. And this is live video. And you can see that the chunks are actually being fetched very periodically but the periodicity uh, is, is much, uh, you know, is, is, is working over smaller time scales because the playback buffers in live video tend to be in the order of two to four seconds rather than in the range of, you know, uh, you know a minute or two or above, which, which is what a typical video on demand would be. And again, if you're looking further down on the bottom left, you can see um, this is a Skype session. You can see that it's bi-directional uh, and, and that gives way that this is a, a bi-directional application such as conferencing. And on the right bottom, a typical download application in this case from Steam that is just blasting away trying to get the most bandwidth it can out of, out of the network. So these kind of pulses are, are fairly unique across application types, across providers. And we have essentially trained our machines to be able to use this fine-grained telemetry that's being 
pushed out of the hardware to us um, to be able to make this deduction. And, and this uh, is, is running today, is operational um, at 400 gigabits per second, and we'll be looking to expand this to higher data rates as we go ahead, which, which is actually quite remarkable because if you go to the industry and try to buy a DPI running of those rates, the prices would be fairly exorbitant. Um, so using um, the machinery, we are able to deduce not just the type of application, but also the experience around it. And we are working with operators um, to help them understand uh, things. For example, in, Net in the case of Netflix, we are able to track every stream of Netflix that's going through. And likewise for YouTube and Disney and so on. Um, we can track the quality of the video we, because if you notice that pattern of chunk fetches, that gives you an indication of how healthy the buffer is, how frequently it's able to load the chunks, and also what rate it's able to load the chunk at. So we are able to deduce the quality of the video, the health, the buffer, and any quality degradations, and uh, basically alert the operator whenever uh, the, the quality is, is degrading, um, or at least give them a post-mortem at the end of the day on how, what was the overall mix of qualities on their network. And likewise for Twitch, as the right bottom for live streaming uh, because there are lots of gamers out there who both consume Twitch and stream Twitch up. So, so we are definitely interested in that segment as well. The segment, in fact, that we are most interested in focusing on a lot is gaming just because uh, gaming is going through a huge growth curve. Um, in 2019, um, gamers spent 150 plus billion dollars in games. And the, and the funny thing is that most of these games are actually free. So the gamers are paying for essentially trinkets inside games, you know, virtual skins and weapons and what have you. Uh, and for them, it's about experience because the better the experience on the game, the more likely they are that they're going to be sticky to that game and, and make in-game purchases and the likes. Um, and and gamers, you know, they're very, very lag sensitive, as in my own house with my kids. Um, even if there's literally like a, a few 100, 200 millisecond lag uh, that can seriously affect their game experience, they can get killed. Yes, you can get killed. So it's a, it's a life or death, a matter of life and death for them. Um, and also, you know, with this lag, they tend to teleport in the game because these games tend to extrapolate their motion. And when there is lag, it just keeps on extrapolating. But when they reconnect, it puts them in a different place. And so that's a very unpleasant experience for gamers. So, and with cloud gaming on the horizon, we have already kind of seen, you know, initial launches of Stadia and then, uh, you know, xCloud is coming and Amazon's launching Tempo and the likes. This market is only going to grow. And this, this is, and cloud gaming is going to impose not just a high bandwidth requirement like streaming video today, but add on to it a very, very stringent latency requirements and a very, very sensitive to any spikes in the lag. So, so there is definitely an opportunity for operators to make sure that, uh, that gaming works and cloud gaming in particular is able to deliver the experience uh, because it could well be the, the next uh, killer app. And as shown on the figure on the right, surveys have shown that lag and latency are in fact the, the biggest reason that gamers get really frustrated with their experience. So operators definitely have a role to play in this and our product, our tool is able to give very, very deep insights into gaming. So we, we do all the top 50 games on Twitch charts and Steam charts. We do mobile games, we do Xbox games and PlayStation games and so on. And we're able to show operators not just a pie chart of all the games that are being played. We are able to help them track every single game session one by one showing them both you know the server against which the game is play, being played but also their lag spikes uh, and the experience associated with it so this deep visibility is helping operators really understand the gamer experience also when they get support calls when gamers complaining their experience wasn't great they're able to help them by quickly identifying where the server is what is the path it's taking is it an issue with the server being you know far away or upstream problem or is it actually a congestion problem in their network um, so to summarize, uh, we believe there's as there's a you know huge opportunity to use the uh, the P4 programmable hardware uh, you know ecosystem that is emerging and the software that supports it like Stratum to deliver deep traffic visibility to network operators at a very affordable price, um, unlike you know, current DPI, which tends to be really expensive. And the method of uh, using you know, the pulse of the flow is, is future-proofed um, and, and therefore resistant to encryption. Um, we also believe that gaming is a huge opportunity for operators because that's where uh, they can look into improving experience, but even offering a premium gaming experience and prepare for cloud gaming. Uh, and for those of you who are interested, you can go to our website, that's canopusnet.com slash insights. We put out insights daily updated on 
the traffic trends that we are seeing across our customers in Australia. And, and just to show you a little snippet on the right, we are showing how conferencing is varying on a day by day basis. Obviously, you know, weekdays tends to go up and weekends comes down. Um, also, it's interactive, so you can click on various providers, Zoom, Teams, Skype, and, and you can see what the relative contributions are. And likewise for gaming on the bottom right, but we also show, you know, other categories like downloads um, and streaming video and the likes. And, Gaming has been steadily on the rise ever since uh, the COVID lockdown. So that's something definitely to keep an eye on. So thank you very much again, Brian. Back to you. Awesome. Thanks for the presentation, PJ. That was great. So for the rest of the session, the plan was to do some, some Q&A. And uh, I have some prepared questions um, and some new ones that I've discovered in just listening to you guys talk. You might also have some questions. Um, so. Maybe I can start us off and we can, we can see where the conversation goes. Um, so one of the interesting uh, things that Suresh commented on and I also alluded to a little bit was heterogeneity of targets. Um, and I think this is also an, probably an important issue to, to VJ. So uh, in, in P4, um, we have different architectures for different target types. There's a PSA architecture, NIC architecture, vendor specific architectures, et cetera. How, how do you guys think about handling uh, the differences between those architectures and designing your programs so you can achieve heterogeneity? Um, Vijay, do you want me to take this? Please do, please do, Suresh. Yeah, so um, like it, we see like uh, one of the things, uh, Brian, we started noticing, right? It's not just like the architecture, but the, but the actual characteristics of the device itself, right? Like, you know, and and, Actually, that's something that's a benefit out of P4. So we don't see it as like a drawback, but more as a benefit that we can put the right kind of uh, pipeline in the right kind of device, right? And, and that's exactly what we're using. So we do see, uh, for example, right, like looking at an x86, right? Like, um, so if you look at like something that an operator requires, there's some stuff that's like, you know, high throughput, like, you know, uh, very low latency and there's like a lot of higher layer functions too. So like, you know, there's like DPI that's required for charging, for example, right on the UPF side, like TCP optimization, um, you know, header enrichment and so on. And those kind of things are best suited for putting on the x86. So the architecture itself and the characteristics of the hardware platform itself give us a benefit like by being able to run the same kind of code on everything. Of course, like, you know, we still need to like do like pretty much like you know, optimize the code for like the every platform. But I think the heterogeneity of the platform actually helps in, in picking the right hardware for the right job. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned different spectrums of hardware, which are right size for right use case. And that, that makes a lot exactly, of sense. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, and also the, um, if you look at it, right, like, um, so like not just the characteristics of the hardware, but the throughput itself. So if you look at like a UPF function, right, like, you know, we are like starting at like uh, terabit plus, right? And there's like uh, cases like stadiums and things like that. So we're talking to some operators who want to do stadium deployments. In, in those cases, it's probably going to be just an x86 with the functions built in along with a smart NIC that's going to be running P4, right? And we can do that because like we did it in P4. So it becomes easy for us to do this code instead of like rewriting the code for every target platform we're going to hit, right? There's like minor adjustments, but like it's really like order of magnitude less work to get it to a new platform than uh, starting from scratch with like microcode or some specific language for the platform. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And while we're on the topic of x86, I think this community is probably quite familiar with uh, BMV2, the behavioral model simulator for P4, uh, which doesn't have great uh, performance and, and isn't really built for production. It, are there open source tools that you're using in this space uh, for, for x running P4 and x86, or is that a proprietary piece for you? Uh, uh, we are doing a lot of experimental stuff. So we have uh, some collaborations with the universities in Montreal and we are building this up. Like we are also building um, our outs, like say our future employee base as well. So we have a chair that we also share like, you know, with one of the universities in Montreal where we're actually doing P4 research, like, you know, externs, for example, right? So, you know, P4 is like very extensible, but like what are the things that are going to be there? What is the library of functions there? So all those things are getting done in collaboration with the universities in Montreal. That's, that's where we are targeting. So like most of the future looking things are like, you know, we are working in collaboration with the university. So like, you know, we can pull in both the results from there as well as like the, um, the people from there. But our goal is to get the students in there, like get them to do their PhDs with us and then like hire them. That's kind of like our, our way of thinking, how we do this thing going forward. Got it. Yeah, I think the, the interesting thing um, 
that you know you're alluding to here is this this more spirit of, of openness which has been kind of hidden from networking for for a while do you guys want to comment on uh, leveraging open source as part of your commercial solutions is it complementary is it competitive how do you how do you view this you want me to go first Suresh? yeah yeah go for it yeah. Uh, absolutely, Brian. I mean, uh, absolutely. I, I think the world has, has completely changed uh, compared to what it was, you know, several years back where everything had to be developed in-house. I mean, our product we are using, you know, uh, of the order of, you know, at least half a dozen to a dozen different uh, pieces of open source coming from different places, you know, of course, Stratum being one of them. And what that means is we can focus on our competitive advantage. I mean, if I look at our intellectual property, it's, it's largely around the machines that we have built and trained. And, and we can focus on that and, and a lot of the other stuff, you know, all the way from visualizations to the switch operating systems to databases. To, there's, there's just so much open source that, that we're leveraging, which means, you know, it's, 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 we're using the best of breed for everything. Uh, and it really reduces the amount of resources we need internally as a startup to really focus on the value that we add. So for us, um, being able to work with this ecosystem, um, you know, with the ONF and a range of other parties is, is an absolute blessing. It gives us the agility, gives us the efficiency, um, which I think is paramount in the modern world. So absolutely. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Like, yeah, we are on a similar path as well. Like, you know, we are like very open source friendly, both on the consumption side and the contribution side. So a lot of the stuff we do, like we uh, upstream, we try to upstream everything, right? Like both, like, you know, so that the community can get the benefits and then like, we don't have to maintain like a fork thing for like very long. So like, you know, we, we do pretty much um, uh, whatever open source stuff we do, anytime we discover like, you know, some uh, issues there or some enhancements on the side, we always like make sure like, you know, we bring it back to the community. For example, like some of the stuff we did with Kubernetes. So everything, our control plane is pretty much Kubernetes containers, right? So like we notice like there's some, um, uh, I would say shortcomings on the networking side of Kubernetes, right? Especially in the operator context. So we started fixing those things and trying to upstream all those like, you know, changes in there. So it becomes available to everybody. So I think this is like gonna be the normal way of working. So even though we are like a commercial company, like you now we're gonna have this like relationship with open source, both on the consumption side, and hopefully everybody is also gonna be contributing. And we do, right? And like, you know, I know Vijay does, but I think the goal is to also um, give back to the community, like uh, so that like the whole industry comes up together. And um, I, I think this is working out very, very well. So like, there's like some fragmentation that needs to get addressed at some point, but like, you know, I, overall, I think it's like uh, the direction is like very positive. Okay, I mean, uh, fragmentation is an interesting uh, piece as well, right? Because now you don't have a single neck to choke, as the operators like to say. Um, you view part of your business as providing support uh, for for the pieces that you're you're incorporating into your solution, or, or how do you how do you navigate that? Um, a, cu a couple of things. So we do have uh, so. Uh, like we, we have some expertise, right? Our expertise is networking, right? Like, so I, um, we don't want to be troubleshooting like kernel bugs, for example, right? So we, we do see some kind of relationship where we do work with other companies, like, you know, who do their specialties. Like, for example, we work closely with Red Hat as a company, right? And, and like, you know, we work pretty closely with them and make sure that they're able to support their pieces very well as the operating system in, the, uh, in there. And um, the integration piece itself is like pretty interesting since you brought it up, right? Like when we talk to operators, um, like it, it is like a major piece, like when people have been uh, used to one uh, neck to choke, right? And it becomes a bit difficult. So like we are seeing a few um, models that are happening. Some of them like in a where we are trying to put together a solution and other ones where we have partners like in jug full markets, like, you know, for example, like, you know, uh, Vijay is in Australia. So we do have a partner in Australia who's putting together this uh, network. So, and, um, but the thing is like, um, there's also other models, like, you know, where like big companies like IBM, for example, right, can be this like, you know, a, a, what I would call like big brother and not in a bad way, right? Like where they kind of like pull in this, like, you know, open source, like systems, like people, who have multi-vendor networks, they can pull together and manage. Like, you know, I, there's like companies like Altran and IBM who are doing a good job in this, like to uh, put together this kind of multi-vendor best-in-class networks. And we want to be part of that and be open ourselves to like systems like that as well. Maybe maybe I'll just add that, that that's a fantastic uh, response to Maybe the, the, I'll also add that I think um, 
there's also a little bit of education required on the part of operators to to kind of help them understand that the world is working a little bit differently to the way it was maybe you know five to ten years ago so um in addition to all the strategies that suresh mentioned you know having some kind of a big brother to take care having partners um sometimes we find we do have to stick our neck out more than we we are necessarily very comfortable with um, and uh, educate the customer on the same on the same side that that look in this new ecosystem there's going to be a little bit of more ownership you have to take of the solution to to have a bit more understanding of the pieces and how they come together rather than you know just treating it as I'll cut a check and I'll have a neck to choke so there's a bit of education involved there too makes sense thanks for that. Uh, yeah yeah, and, and like, you know, market wise, like, you know, I think uh, one really good thing like Guru that you've done, like really with like, you know, ONF and the education stuff is like, we can have like really good partners. Like in our partner in Australia is Redfig, right? And Redfig has like P4 qualified and trained people. So like, you know, um, so even in Japan, when we talk to like our partners there, like, you know, there's been like, you know, ONF like events, like P4 events and like there's like a lot of people um, in the SI and, and bar business, like who have a really good knowledge of P4. And this wasn't like that two years ago. And like really this ONF outreach stuff, like uh, it has really helped out quite a bit to get like partners who are knowledgeable in doing this, like independently from us, right? And uh, th that's really helped a lot as well. Oh, great, thanks Thanks for the, uh, the feedback. Do you guys have any questions? I have a, a whole list that we can keep going for forever, but. Uh, um, Thank you for Brian. Sure. Uh, so, so my next one was was more towards VJ, um, but but maybe for both of you, um, you alluded to this uh, fact that through fl flow pulses you can define whether a user is having like a, a bad experience or or something like that. How do you how do you define bad or bad experience in this context, and does it require input from the user? Uh, or Very good question. So obviously the experience is very specific to the particular application. So in the case of, um, let's take Netflix as an example. From a user point of view, the typical things that, that contribute experience are um, if there's a stall. If I get the spinning wheel, that's a bad thing. Um, if the, the resolution of the video is low, that's a bad thing. If it, the video takes a long time to start, that's a bad thing. So let's take those three metrics. And what our tool is doing is by, because we are looking at the pulse of the flow, we are tracking things like obviously the, the rate at which a chunk is fetched. That tells us if the, if the Netflix stream is actually running at the maximum available resolution or not. Namely, whether it's limited by the source uh, content resolution or whether it's limited by the network. So we are able to deduce that as user experience. We track buffer health because we are seeing chunks of video going. So that tells us if the buffer is going to get depleted. And we can predict the wheel is going to spin in a few seconds for you. So that is a measure of experience. But that's very application specific for streaming video. For gaming experiences that are on uh, lag spikes. So we, we kind of get an idea of the baseline lag depending on the server you're playing against and whenever there's a spike we detect it and for different kind of games so we have categorized our games into you know the different genres shooting games versus role playing games versus sports games and um, and for each genre we have certain you know uh, we put some watermarks on what is kind of a green or a good experience what's orange and what's red so it is very application specific and and you know going forward we are now starting to develop that for video conferencing as an example because obviously with people working from home that's becoming an important thing so the experience there's no one magic number it's application specific and often it's a collection of metrics specific specific to a, a kind of application yeah. Going, going maybe one, one step further. So this visibility on, on one hand from a technologist perspective is, is great. And maybe pushing this beyond the scope of, of the technical discussion here. What does this mean for, for privacy? Um, how do we protect users' privacy? How do we prevent new applications from, from getting access to, to user-specific data? Have, have, have you thought about that or do you have any concerns there? Um, I mean, obviously privacy is a, is, is a huge concern. Um, I mean, look, we... At, at least let's say this, that we, we know that there's a Netflix stream going. We absolutely don't know what video is being played and we absolutely make no effort to even try to deduce that even if we could, right? So it's, it's very much around trying to figure out the kind of application and if the experience is, is good enough. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, you know, you don't want to get too intrusive and, and, and treat this as a, as a way to monitor what people are doing, but definitely as an operator, um, 
the operators do get the blame, right? If operate, operators, and I've, you know, the, we've been talking to, they get support calls, which basically says um, a, a user had a bad gaming experience or the Netflix is not working well. So we see this as a tool that equips operators to better understand those problems and react to them rather than just saying, oh, buy a bigger plan, uh, which is their typical response, right? So that's the way we see it. Um, and uh, so, I mean, uh, while I fully understand that there are potential privacy implications, we definitely mitigate them by not, you know, trying to be intrusive to the extent where we know the kind, the, the actual content being played, right? So, if that helps. No, oh, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. And I've got, well, maybe one more for Suresh before we, before we end here. Um, so, a lot of people, you know, may still think P4 equals Tofino equals data center switch. And a lot of the user plane functions that we're talking about um, require other features like hierarchical or multi-layer QoS, uh, buffering, stuff like that. How, how do you approach uh, some of those um, other networking features that aren't maybe present in, in some of your, your targets? Uh, sounds good. Like, so um, it, it has a very fair point, right? Like hierarchical QoS is like something that comes up specifically in the PNG context, like quite a bit, right? And um, so like we have like a two prong strategy, right? Like one of them with the, with the Tofino, we are using the FPGA for some of the queuing stuff um, at this point, right? And, and, and we do see Tofino 2 coming in, right? And the Tofino 2 is gonna have the hierarchy QoS. So that's the beauty of it, right? Like, so I can make my decisions today on what hardware to use today and tomorrow if better hardware turns up, right? With, for the Tofino 2, I'm gonna have those features. I, I, I think this is gonna be, like the model going forward. So you have the same kind of way of writing applications and when this new hardware comes out with capabilities that you need, you'll be able to use them pretty much with like very minimal effort to like move your code over, right? So the biggest like, you know, putting effort we've done is to move from P414 to 16, right? So like, you know, like, you know, try to re-optimize all the code. So that's been the biggest effort. Like getting on a new hardware platform is like, uh, I think like much easier than doing this. So. I think that's the attraction of this, like mainly. So you, you think of it as like a shortcoming as well, right? But it's really an attraction. So when like new hardware comes in that has these features, it's, it's pretty much free for you to use. And, and like, we're gonna have to, you know, to like, you know, later this year, right? Like early samples are already out. Like, you know, we'll be able to do, and we're already simulating those things today. Like, you know, how we're gonna do this. And that's kind of why you're kind of holding off on the BNG kind of application. But like, we seriously are like, planning to have it all pretty soon, right? And even more than that, uh, P4 gives us a way of unifying data planes for fixed and mobile, right? Which we didn't have a chance to do before. So there's this thing called AGF that the broadband forum is working on. And we can have the same kind of control user separation that we have for 5G, which is the N4 interface, something very similar to that for, for broadband, right? So if we could have this like single piece of hardware, right? Running programmable code, that is today starting off with the mobile, you know, broadband stuff. It starts doing the fixed wireless for 5G and it's gonna start like pulling in all the fixed customers too. Like you just throw this in, it's like this magic box that can handle like all kinds of access termination, right? And also your switching function. So like you, like, like you said, right? Like, you know, the idea is like, you know, the sky is the limit here. Like, you know, we're gonna have load balancers and firewalls and like, you know, packet broker stuff, analytics, like everything, like, you know, using the same kind of platform running on open hardware. That's, that's the real um, end game here, right? Like that's where we're heading towards. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. So uh, before we close, do you, do you have any last, last thoughts, things you wanna leave people with? Maybe we can start with Suresh. No, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, Brian, Guru, and Michelle, thank you. thanks a lot. And uh, like, we really hope like, you know, the ecosystem keeps getting bigger and bigger and like we get to meet more and more new companies to work in the space and uh, together we can conquer. So, awesome. Anything yeah. new, Vijay? Thank you very much, Brian, for the opportunity. I think I, I really, you know, commend the efforts from the ONF and the whole community to really, you know, uh, change the thinking among the network operators because uh, everybody knows they're a little bit of a tough nut to crack. Um, you know, their absorption of uh, open source and white boxes is, is uh, you know, they have bigger hurdles to overcome than maybe the, the cloud or the data center operators. So really thank you for uh, helping build the ecosystem. Uh, we are super excited about the opportunities. I think we are still scratching the surface on 
on the potential. I mean, what we are doing with our visibility is, is one aspect of it and, and what Suration and Kaluma are doing is another aspect, but I think there's, there's still a long road ahead of us and, and it's, it's full of opportunity. So we're really excited about this. Thanks. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks Vijay and Suresh for, for tuning in and spending time today. And thanks for all of you at home who have uh, tuned into this panel, the uh, P4 Enabled Solutions for Operator Networks panel, and hope you enjoy the rest of your, your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.